Okay, thank you. Um, so yes, um, my name's um, Oliver Davis. This is um, Ian Dennis. We're both from Cardiff University. And um, we're going to do a bit of a double act today, so hopefully that will be a smooth transition between okay, us. One. But uh, who, who knows? Maybe a bit of Lauren Hardy. Right? Um, uh, our other colleague, uh, Johannes uh, Muller-Kissing from, uh, from Germany, couldn't make it today, but uh, uh, hopefully we'll, we will do him justice. So, we're talking about Hilfort's um, in Germany. Hilfort's in southern Germany, of course, at uh, the so-called sort of Furstensitzer, uh, Baden-Württemberg, you know, become particularly well known in recent years, and uh, <coughs> rightly so, you know, spectacular finds from places like uh, the Heuneberg um, and the Glauberg. Hilfort's in the rest of Germany, however, uh, particularly those um, in the central German Highlands, the so-called Mittelgebirge Zone. I'm, I'm not a natural linguist, by the way, so uh, apologies for my <laughs> German pronunciation. Um, uh, in, in these areas, they've received much less um, attention. Uh, the Iron Age settlement pattern in these regions is really dominated by unenclosed farming settlements, mainly um, located in the river valleys, but there are hill forts, around 70 or so um, are known uh, in this area. Um, very few, noticeably, are located to the north of this region, within the, the so-called sort of North German Plain. Uh, that, well, sites that we would traditionally call hill forts. There are sites, palisaded, uh, uh, enclosed sites in that area. Hill forts um, in this region, though, of Germany, the sort of North uh, Central Highlands, um, some of them are, however, spectacular um, and have produced remarkable finds. Uh, for example, the uh, weapon deposits found at the Dunsberg um, and the Wilsenberg. Uh, some of the weapons clearly treated uh, or destroyed before deposition, the sort of bending of sword blades. Um, quite reminiscent, I suppose, of the treatment of remain or the treatment of these, this type of material um, at the so-called Gallic sanctuaries like Gournay, sur Ronde, uh, Ribemont sur Anker that we, that we heard about um, earlier. As a whole, though, um, there's been relatively little um, excavation of hill forts um, in, the, in the area. Most sites are forest covered, uh, so like the uh, Hunenberg uh, in, the, in the top right-hand corner here and therefore not really threatened by development, so uh, the, the little or no rescue archaeology. Uh, and that's coupled with a, a real lack of kind of ma major large-scale research projects. So this means that, that we have a really a, a poor understanding, really, of, of even basic questions um, such as chronology um, or function. Our work then has, has actually concentrated mainly on, on this region um, uh, that we call Northeast uh, Westphalia, uh, and it's really an attempt to kind of address this imbalance um, of knowledge. Uh, the work is a collaboration between Cardiff University and Bochum University in Germany and the Lippischlander um, Museum. We like to think of this as a kind of reverse Brexit, if you will. Uh, the project did start at the point of what the Brexit vote was, was made, rather ironically. Um, the region is, is on the boundary of what is traditionally and probably rather unhelpfully called the kind of the Celtic and Germanic um, worlds. Uh, topographically, uh, it can be separated into a, into a kind of lowland north area um, and a, a sort of an upland southern area. Uh, uh, southern area, and that's broadly separated by the Teutoburgo Ridge, which is this, uh, this um, promontory of land here, um, which is forest covered, the, the so called Teutoburgo um, Forest, um, known famously historically uh, as the location um, of, the, of the, uh, uh, the victory of Germanic tribes unified under uh, the leader Arminius um, against the Roman legions. Um, which really sort of checked Roman advances um, into this kind of north um, German area. A number of hill forts known in this region, about 29 in total, um, and they're really arranged into two um, distinct groups, a northern group and a southern group. Now in the south, the, the hill forts tend to be smaller, 
Um, they tend to be um, located much closer um, together. But our work is concentrated on this northern group of around 11 sites, um, which are larger uh, and distributed um, generally further um, apart. Hill forts uh, in this kind of northern group then enclose um, areas ranging from about 6 to, to 30 hectares, but most of them enclose areas um, in the sort of the range of 7 to 10 hectares in size. All but one are what we would call multivalate. The Rodenstadt is the only one which appear, apparently only has a, a single um, rampart. Um, this could suggest then kind of development over time, um, but certainly some elements of these hill forts, the smaller inner enclosures here at the Twinsburg, for instance, and Babylone, um, are almost certainly uh, are being demonstrated to be medieval in origin. So there's kind of early medieval um, reuse um, of, these, uh, of these sites. Generally, um, while parts of the, hilltop, uh, the hill forts crown the tops um, of hills or ridges, the enclosures themselves are, uh, appear to be kind of tilted uh, in particular directions, uh, as if to make the, the interiors kind of highly visible um, to the adjacent lowland valleys. Interestingly, the multivallation is often also orientated in that, um, in that direction. The entrances vary from kind of simple gaps as at the Rodenstadt to sort of highly elaborate with hornworks at the, at the Hurlingsburg. And so the, the differences may be chronological, they may be developing um, over time, but that's not really um, very well understood. And another interesting point is that almost all of them uh, contain natural springs, and this seems to be a, a deliberate decision which is made um, the, hill, uh, the, the, the ramparts themselves appear to deviate from their courses to make sure that they, they include the springs within the interior um, areas. The first studies of, of, of hill forts in this, in this region were, were undertaken by Klostermeyer in, in, the, in the 1800s. Um, and and he, uh, he and his, his successors really saw them as, uh, as kind of Germanic fortifications built to to repel the, the Roman advances um, into the region. Uh, and this was memorialized uh, famously with the construction of uh, the, the, the statue of Arminius, the Hermann's Denkmal, uh, in, the, in the actual hill fort of the Grotenberg. New work after World War II in the 50s and the 60s by people like Hohenschwert um, began to kind of challenge this view. Um, but unfortunately, the, the excavations have remained rather small scale, and so interpretations haven't really moved on um, uh, particularly. Of this kind of northern group of hill forts, though, the, 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 the best known, I suppose, uh, is that of the Hudenberg by Gellinghausen. Um, this has been uh, recently excavated on a relatively large scale by uh, Werner Best, um, shown it mainly to be a medieval, but actually with Iron Age um, origins. Excavations within the uh, inner enclosure identified um, a timber box uh, Iron Age rampart fronted by stone and with a substantial gatehouse, which you can see in this, this bottom right hand um, image. The rampart itself is, uh, it appears to have been burnt, um, and six spearheads were found scattered um, in the entranceway, um, leading the excavators to, to suggest that this was evidence of an assault um, onto the site. Um, but I think if you take this together with, uh, with the metal finds from the other sites, such as the Dunsberg and the Wilson, uh, Wilsonberg, um, it may be suggestive of other practices, potentially even deliberate deposition, um, potentially cultic um, behavior, or the display of war trophies um, at these sites. Uh, excavations within the interior suggested that you know, there was evidence of occupation uh, and radiocarbon dates suggesting uh, the, uh, the construction of the site at some point in the 4th to, to 2nd centuries um, BC. Our work then has, has actually concentrated on two uh, of the other hill forts to, to the north uh, of the Hunenberg, uh, that of the Grottenberg and, and the Pippenkopf, which are situated at Grottenberg on the Teutoburga Ridge and, and the Pippenkopf um, to the northeast. And I'll hand over to my colleague here at this point. Okay, so 
we began the program a couple of years ago in uh, 2017 and uh, we were asked to collaborate and uh, to work on two hill forts. Uh, the ones that we chose that uh, my German colleagues are very interested in was the first one was the Grottenberg, which is obviously where our Arminius is located. Uh, Arminius is located in the center, as you can see on, uh, on, on the plan. It was dug by Nablitsky in 1951, and he put around, I think it was 10 trenches on the outer works. There is an inner works where um, Arminius is located, where two more trenches were placed. And these, again, were um, uh, systematically dug. Um, the records of the Grottenberg from the Detmold Museum have actually um, disappeared. So again, we were asked to actually reinvestigate, look at it, try and find some more dating evidence. Both the hill forts that we've investigated have only got one date. Um, the Grottenberg has a bit of a strange one. It's known for the uh, Grosse Hunering or the large stone wall that goes around the outside. And yet the literature says that the dating for it came from a palisaded part of, of, of the rampart. So we went to investigate and um, first one we put up, on. Oh, come on. Yeah. Yes, that's it. So we, <clears throat> again, as Ollie mentioned, we are in a heavy forest, forested area. So trying to find a nice place to put your trench is a bit of hard work, especially as the trees are up and standing and also ones that have died and then obviously on the rampart itself. So Although our trenches over the time may be a little bit bitty, it's because it's not that we can't join them, it's because there's trees in the way that actually can't do it. So the first bit that we exposed was towards the south, on the southern half of the rampart, where the stone wall is visible. Um, cleared it off, quite good preservation, good archeology. span um, There are sort of uh, construction uh, methods to the wall, and it looks a bit cellular with large stones and then evidence for possible posts within the center you can see a post packing um, and then around that post packing there was some burning and then when we removed it all we could see there's a burning patch which hopefully we get some dating evidence for to give us some idea of maybe when this was first constructed and then we're down onto what they call i think it's called in general the flamings mile which is a, a lovely uh, copper mile with nice and bright and, and orange um, we were also very interested in the interior um, again Nabeski reported that the um, they found an area on the inside where they had post holes in a line that could be structures. Again, we used our geophysics that have been done, so we located an area where we could actually fit the area in. Again, and we started to find very similar post holes. So they looked very regular, looked very in a line, and I was talking with the forester and Johannes when we were there, and I looked around and went, they're in line with all the beech trees. So what we've actually got <laughs> is a beech tree plantation where they use a cora pop it in and it gets to three or four years old and they take it out and they were like oh no so there was absolutely nothing there it's like oh wow well, we can wrap that one up that was easy that's fine but what we have found at the Grottenberg is that there's it has been absolutely worked to death by modern uh, car parks visitor centers everything there have been no finds from the Grottenberg apart from one peeler that was found on trench five towards the north of it uh, that has had a rip report on it and this year we're actually digging because we reopened up the trenches from that area and um, we found another socket that made it from a spear that has come through. The two photographs at the north, this is where the alleged palisade is or was and we refound the old German trenches uh, from 1951 and re-excavated them out and they had found a post at the back but then they'd stopped short to actually carry on over to the wall so that was really good because we've actually now found evidence of the wall to the northern side which they didn't think was actually there as you can see but also it's been very robbed out because in the 13th or 14th century in the medieval period there is documentation that somebody paid whoever it was the landover to take the stone away and we also know that when they built the arminius monument they used a lot of the stone as the rubble core for the actual monument itself so the wall would probably have been a lot more impressive that was one of our latest excavations, this on the bottom photo this summer, and our wall was in much, much better condition, much larger, a lot better preserved, and we have got features appearing at the back and structures butting up onto the wall. So, I then run over another 35 kilometres at the same time, we'll dig in the Rottenberg, we went into the Pippenkopf. 
So the Pippin Cough is just outside Lem Lemgo, uh, which is about 35 miles north of, of Detmold, uh, near a town called Dordentrup. Um, we have a light, uh, LiDAR image of the Pippin Cough, and you can see it's got the multi valet we've got the blue inner, uh, the yellow is a, a palisaded one, and the green one we're not too sure, it has been recorded, but no one's actually ever dropped a trench over that one yet to see what it actually consists of. Excavations were done by Nobletsk again in 1939. Uh, he did three schnitts or trenches over the, uh, in, two on the inner ramparts and one on the palisade ramparts. Hohenschwert again reinvestigated and dropped another trench or schnitt four over the, the wall, over the wall and rampart in 1966. And this is where we came in because schnitt two towards the north was not finished. War broke out. So they just left the trench open and during the poor war period the Pippin Kopf was used as a quarry because it's got quartzite so it's a very important resource for, for the Germans and so they, they got the large quarry to the north. Our main objective of what we were asked to do we were to open up the old trench from 1939, recut, reevaluate and re-record. Okay so as you can see, we cut it back really quite nice. Found the 1939 German trenches, which were quite nice. Um, the wall is in situ, uh, in, in section, sorry. And if you look at the bottom right hand one, what we have got is the back of the rampart, which shows some really nice burning. And you have an upright post with a beam coming at the back. This was really quite surprising because it's really, really well uh, burnt with a really dark layer. So this year again, we carried on with our uh, excavations and we opened up a lot more area towards the north of the wall. And as we got up there, lo and behold, more and more burning at the back of the rampart with the posts upright and large carbonized beams. Uh, this was also prevalent in Hohenschwert and Blitz work on the lower ramparts. The whole of the rampart of the Pippenkopf has been burnt systematically. And the one thing that we noticed as we were going down, the soil or the clays above the burning is also scorched. So at some point within the very close proximity of it being burnt, they've actually then covered it with more material which has got ceramic fines within it. So probably within 48 hours of the burning, they're beginning to start to cover this up, which is a bit, a bit strange. We did do some work on the interior. Again, the heat this year actually calf killed my students, so we couldn't work as, as a bigger area as we wanted. And, but we did find in a four by four meter area that we dug over 200 shirts of, of ceramic pottery that was, that was coming out. Spindle walls, finger impressed. I think it's called the rooped wear, I think it's called, but it's rough and, and saggy on the outside. Yeah, so, and that was quite a lot. I mean, for the, but there was no associated features uh, within that area. But we'll go back next year and we're going to open up a good 10 by 20 square meter area. Okay. So, Wally. Thank you, Ian. So, trying to, to bring that together with some kind of narrative there. What, what, can, we, what can we actually say? So, can, Standing back from the detail then, you know, there are a number, I think, of common patterns. When looking at our work at, at, at the Pippenkopf and, and, and the Grotterberg, and actually looking at other excavations, of, of uh, small-scale excavations of hillforts in, in the area, um, perhaps one of the most striking elements, we've already heard about this uh, in an Irish context, um, is the burning of the ramparts. This seems to be um, quite a consistent uh, pattern that's been identified at the Pippenkopf, at the Grotenberg and actually at all the hill forts that have been excavated um, in the area. Um, burnt ramparts have been increasingly recognized in recent years with the petrified forts of, uh, of Britain and France to the Irish hill forts that we, that we heard about um, um, before, before the break. Uh, and even the, the first and Sitzer in the southern Germany seem to have uh, burning, uh, burning events um, uh, that have been revealed. These are often attributed to, to accidents um, or the result of external or internal conflict. But I think there are a number of problems um, with using those kinds of interpretations for the Westphalian sites. Um, firstly, if you uh, use the tactical use of fire in an assault, you might expect um, localised burning, particularly around entrances. Um, however, at sites like the Pippenkopf, um, it's the entire rampart which has been systematically burned down. Second, the burning of, of, of the timber elements is, is unlikely to be accidental because it would have required 
considerable resources, accelerants, brushwood, smearing it with animal fat, things like that, to aid combustion. And finally, the systematic destruction of the rampart, whilst it could be the punitive raising after capture, um, there, would be a, there would have been little point at the, at the Pippin Cough. What Ian forgot to mention was that a charcoal analysis showed that the, the timber beams were heavily rotten, decayed. This was a hill fort that was already structurally compromised, yet it was chosen at this point um, to be destroyed um, through fire. So whilst violent endings can't be discounted, Perhaps we could also consider that these are deliberate acts of conspicuous destruction and um, potentially by the inhabitants. If we accept that a hill fort might have been understood as a kind of a physical representation of the community that would have been brought together to create it, then its physical destruction would also signify the dramatic ending of that community or those community relationships. The glow uh, from a burning hill fort would have been spectacular, highly visible, and its meaning you know, would have been seen and felt far um, and wide. The interiors of these sites continue to be little understood, and large-scale open area exploration is, is desperately needed and, and planned for. Um, however, there are noticeable terraces contained within many of the hill forts being, being identified through LIDAR, suggesting that they are potentially intensively um, occupied and they might be related to then the phases of you know the concentration or centralization um, of populations in terms of locations as well they obviously sit in elevated locations but these are somewhat peripheral to the lowlands that were presumably more regularly occupied um, and the hillforts appear designed to, to kind of directly overlook those uh, lower lying areas in other words the hillforts a part of bigger landscapes, as part of, of, of a round of movement. They're kind of points along natural routeways, the pathways that people and animals are regularly treading. Finally, just think about chronology here. Dating is really not very good, but when we bring together all of the dates from all of the sites considered, all the, the radiocarbon dates, there does seem to be a specific construction horizon between the 4th and 2nd centuries, uh, or between 400 and 200 um, BC. Why they appear at that point is not well understood, and hopefully that's a question that we may begin to answer. Their emergence does coincide with, with broad changes in burial rites, um, which may indicate kind of profound social changes. But whether hillforts are a, a result or a cause of these changes is, is, a, is an interesting question. Interestingly, this period precedes, proceeds um, the kind of the abandonment of uh, the uh, hillforts in the south. So as we're getting centralization in the north, those first and sits in the south, we seem to get to be seeing the decentralization um, of populations. So just to conclude then, you know, the, the northeast of Westphalia is not a coherent pattern. There are, there are distinct groups of hill forts in, the, in this area. Um, considerable labour is being put into not just their construction, but also into their just destruction, which I think is a very interesting point. They're emerging probably at some point in the 4th fourth, fourth century, although their abandonment is still a little bit unclear. We haven't got dates um, for their abandonment, but I, I suspect they're relatively short-lived. Um, there's little evidence of ramparts, for instance, being um, reconstructed. Um, so perhaps we're seeing kind of moves towards centralised social forms around this time, but it's not linear, and we get kind of decentralisation of populations again. You know, mirrors at a later date the, you know, those kinds of social trajectories that we see in southern Germany. Thank you.